Merry Christmas! The Agape Ministry is sponsoring the First Family Christmas on Sunday, December 24th, during Sunday morning worship. Everyone is encouraged to give their very, very best in this endeavor. Let's show our love and appreciation to the First Family for Christmas. Protege, don't forget your monthly Zoom schedule on Wednesday, December 20th at 7 p.m. Please check your text and email messages for login credentials. Lean over to your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, and all that gas. Getting, get an understanding. So the message would come by being relative number two, the message would come from the laws of reciprocity. The laws of reciprocity. And please listen to me because some of the mess that we found ourselves in was some of the stuff that we created. And we act so new when we experience the outcome of it. Why plant a seed and dis spies or despise the harvest. We're acting new. We're wondering why there's so much mess in our lives. Could it be that we're sowing drama? Oh, y'all ain't saying that now. We're having some chaos in our lives. Could it be is that we've been hanging around chaotic people? It was phenomenal. Uh, Bishop talked about making your mess your message. I think sometimes we forget as believers that when we're going through trials and things that are in contradiction to what we want to do, sometimes God is setting up for an opportunity to make it a message. So don't trip, hang out. Uh, it was really on time word. Oh, it was awesome. Bishop did an awesome job. I just love his teaching every Sunday. But today he touched on my very first sermon that I get, God gave me was from the book of Job called Picked Out to Be Picked On when Bishop brought that today. Oh, it just brought back memories, and I say thank you, God, for the man of God. Well, I'm happy I got two doses. I got the Woodlands this morning, and I got Houston, and it was so good um, talking about Job, talking about his story, how God don't allow the devil to do nothing that he don't have an answer for. So the devil can't do nothing unless he get permission from God. It was really good. I appreciated the message. I appreciated the praise. Expect a welcome, welcoming experience. Yeah. Expect um, praise to be in the house. Expect God to be glorified. The same. The message, I really enjoyed the message. The praise was, I love the songs, just everybody into it, and everything just seemed so genuine. It was a great atmosphere over everything. It just puts you in a position of receiving the word more than anything. That's what it was. Thank you for your prayers and support for the 45th annual Thanksgiving Super Feast. That was a tremendous success. We have another hurdle to jump for the 45th annual Christmas Eve Super Feast that will be held at the George R. Brown Convention Center on Saturday, December 23rd. There are volunteer opportunities available and we're accepting donations of clothing, toys, canned goods, and other non-perishables and frozen turkeys. For more information, please visit citywideclub.com or contact the business office. Volunteers are needed for the annual Channel 39 Super Toy Drive benefiting the Citywide Club's 45th annual Christmas Eve Super Feast on Monday, December 18th. For more information, please call 713-752-2582 or contact the business office. The city is the place to be. Sunday, December 31st at 10 p.m. for the annual New Year's Eve Yam Service. Come and get your praise on through great singing, worship, and fellowship at the City Cathedral Woodlands Campus. Don't you dare miss it. Join the Cunanier Sorority for a Cunanier Christmas at Maggiano's Restaurant Sunday, December 17th at 3.30 p.m. The cost is $55 per person. Cash app the Cunanier Sorority to reserve your seat today. You don't want to miss it. Get ready. It's almost time for the annual Mirth and Mistletoe Musical and Theatrics and Christmas Cantata featuring Bishop Leroy J. Wooder Jr. and some here at the City Cathedral on Sunday, December 24th at 8.30 a.m. at the Woodlands Campus and 10.30 a.m. at the Houston Campus. This is the place to be. Remember, if you want to know the happenings this week, please reference our weekly City Columns publication. Don't forget to patronize our family business. Do you want to further your Christian education? Enroll today in the Cunanier Theological College. Scholarships are available. Please sign up today or call the business office for more information information. Exciting! Do you love Starbucks? Then no need to stop before church to get your fix. Our very own coffee cafe is open each Sunday. Stop in and enjoy before or after service. And I'm your announcing clerk, Ricky K. Williams, with the City Cathedral Praise Press Live.
celebrate and put your hands together. Come on. Is that right? We bow a little bit. We celebrate them today. Oh, yes, we do. Sing this with me. Sing, no one else can receive the glory. No one else can receive the glory. No one else can receive the praise. No one else can receive the praise. Sing, no one else can receive the glory. No one else can receive the glory. No one else can receive the praise. No because he's holy, he's holy and is righteous, righteous omnipotent, omnipotent and mighty, and mighty Alpha, Alpha Omega, Omega my, Redeemer, my Redeemer and Savior. Oh, no one else can receive the glory. No one else can receive the glory. No one else can receive the praise. No one else can receive the praise. No one else can receive the glory. No one else can receive the glory. No one else can receive the praise. Oh, because he's holy and is righteous, omnipotent and mighty. Alpha, Omega, my Redeemer and Savior. Oh, no one else can receive the glory. No one else can. No one else can receive the praise. Oh, no one else can receive the glory. No one else can receive the praise. Here we go. Come on, say. Because he's holy, he's holy, and he's righteous, omnipotent, omnipotent, and mighty, mighty. Alpha, Alpha, Omega. My Redeemer, my Redeemer, and Savior, my Savior. tell him that he's holy, he's holy and righteous, and righteous omnipotent, omnipotent, and mighty, and mighty Alpha, Alpha and Omega. And Omega. My, Redeemer, my Redeemer, one more time, and Savior, my Savior, tell him that he's holy, he's holy and he's righteous, and righteous omnipotent, omnipotent, and mighty, and mighty Alpha, Alpha, Alpha Omega. Omega. My Redeemer, my Redeemer and Savior. My Come on, Savior. put them together. Come on, let's celebrate them. How many know that all the glory and honor belongs to our God? He is truly worthy to be praised. We exalt him and lift him. Come on, put your hands together. Come on. We bless you from the fruit of our lips. Come on. Here we go. Say all the glory. All the glory. All of the honor. Come on. All of the praise to you. Oh, my mind to you. I give you all my time to you. Belongs to you. All of it, all of it belongs to you. Oh, it belongs to you. All of it belongs to you. Come on. How do you know all the glory belongs to him? And all of the praise and all of the worship. All of it belongs. We give you what you deserve. We give you what you deserve. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 We open our mouths and we exalt you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory.
protecting me. He's a provider, a weight maker. He's a healer. Jehovah Jireh, a provider. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Reverence him. Lift him. Hallelujah. 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 To the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So I will bless the Lord at all, at all times, and his praise, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth, be in my mouth, be in my hands, be in my feet. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Everybody put your hands. Are you ready to take the praise of the Lord higher? I need your help this morning. We're going to warm this place up in here with the Holy Spirit. Come on. Come on. It's all right if you move a little bit. Here we go. Sing hallelujah. 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 I came to bless him. He's been good and mighty kind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With my hands. Lift it up. Hallelujah. Everybody, Hallelujah. sing it with me. 
to the Lord and give him a loud praise, won't you? Somebody say yeah. Come on, put your preacher's voice. Yeah. things that he has done. Minister Beverly, just go oh, taste and see how good the Lord is. And the Lord is truly good and the Lord is truly good. There's just some things you just got to get out of your system. You just got to get it out before you go to the next stanza. And I know that you brought your Bibles. Come on, give it away for the night for the Christian symphony and say this. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. Today I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive. I'm ready to hear the incorruptible, irrefutable word of God. I will never be the same. Never, 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 never. Never be the same. In Jesus' name. Come on, give it away once again. 
Go with me to the book of Mark. God bless this worship and praise team. Sister Regina, MD, Dr. Josh, all of these wonderful musicians, these psalters. In the book of Mark chapter 6, let's start with verse 45. Uh, the book of Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 51. It's a very short read, Brother Tucker, and it should be on the board, Brother Boston. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. If you have it, say, I've got it. And go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. Wild, he dismissed the crowd. After leaving, as it were, he went up on a mountainside to pray. And when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake. And he was alone on land. But he saw the disciples straining, as it were, because of the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, not the first, not the second, not the third, God waited until all of those times had exit out. But on the fourth watch, which means that was the first watch, that, that, was, that was a second watch, that was a third watch, but on the fourth watch, He came. He went out to them walking on water. It was about to pass them by, but when they saw Jesus walking on the water, Bishop Rose, they thought it was a ghost. So they cried out out of terror and in terror. Immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed in the boat with his disciples. And the storm died down. Well, that's a message all by itself. Can I give you a cousin them scripture to that too as well? The book of the book of Matthew, chapter 8. Let's start with verse 23. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a ferocious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. I like to use as a clarion to this little piece, part five, make your mess your message. You may be seated before the affidavit of the Lord. Make your mess your message. I believe I will, daughter. God bless you. Make your mess your message. I want you to underscore the word message because you, you can look at the continuity of your previous scriptures, the previous notes that you took on last week and all week, all month that we've been talking about, make your mess your message. I want you to underscore the word message because, Sister Tiffany, in the Greek tongue, it deals with epigelia, epigelia. It is E P A G G. L-I-A, E-P-A, G-G-E-L-I-A. It is the promise of God or a divine revelation of God that even when we experience a messy situation in terms of trouble, which is our lived experiences, please know that God is there in proxy to give you a divine message. He may not necessarily give you a reason behind the drama, but he'll certainly give you a revelation. 
and if you and and if you stay open to the voice of God in terms of receiving a divine revelation of God sometime you can understand why you're going through what you're going through without necessarily God giving you a specific reason of what you're going through what you're going through. So the mess is really, and, it, and, and, and I want to pull it from its vernacular and from, from its jargon, that the mess is really our lived experiences that sometimes made us uncomfortable. And the lived experiences, watch this, created, creates the classroom as we talked about the institution. The lived experiences is a, is a product of repetitive situations. And I want you to underscore the word um, repetition because repetition is the mother to learning. <laughs> there are some things because of our stubbornness. He allows us, even when he allows us to experience these repetitive situations. He does it oftentimes because he's trying to soften our mindset because of our hard-headedness. Right, right. If I can remove the microcosm to the microcosm. And so he allows us to stay in this situation and these situations until we are convinced that you need God to help you to find some peace and some clarity while going through what's seemingly to be uncomfortable. And that's good because we ought to learn from our bitter lived experiences. It ought to become a private and public classroom. We ought to be able to tell some people and of course tell yourself, I learned something behind this situation. Do I have any co-signers? That there are some, I ain't said all of the situation you learned from, there were some. You say, Lord, if you just bring me out of this one. I think y'all can finish that one. I'm, I may do something else, but I ain't going to do this particular situation. So in the book of Psalm, chapter 119, verse 71, we talked about it earlier that David says, I learned that it's good when I experience my afflictions because I learned something. The good behind the experienced conflict and afflictions is because you learned something. It was worth my going through as long as I was taught by it. I want you to underscore the word learn because the word learn is, is an open-mindedness word that deals with the word lamad, L-A-M-A-D, or to be taught by it. I'm taught. I was taught by something. I didn't, I didn't need anybody to teach me. Some kind of way my lived experience became my classroom and it taught me something. It taught me something. It taught me something. And sometimes the teaching of God is when he allows you to marinate in deep waters of affliction and conflict that is not designed to drown you but to cleanse you. All right, all right. And that's very important that, that we understand that yes, I'm going through some, some deep waters of affliction, but some deep waters and those afflictions and conflicts, they have rules. They are not designed to drown me or destroy me, but yet define me. So what feels like the end of the world is really a platform to a far better place. I need you to talk back to me and then look at your neighbor next door, those that are online too as well. There's a better place now. Don't, don't allow what you feel as an end to become your actual end. The Lord will, will sometime allow your test to become a testimony. So it's good. It was good for me to be afflicted. What made it good was not the affliction, but the lesson learned behind it. 
ain't no need in us enjoying affliction. I don't enjoy pain. But pain is an indication that something is wrong. I wish I had somebody here. Pain is an indication that I don't need to be in love with something that is not God's will. High five your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, but that was good because I learned something from it. I was taught by it. He left me in the classroom of affliction long enough. And some of us, we've been in the classroom of affliction over time because we refuse to learn the lesson from it. I'm talking back to every, I wish I had somebody, some co-signers. Don't let me swim in the sharks by myself. It's important that you learn a lesson. Learn a lesson. Lean over to your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, learn from it. Go ahead and tell them. So in this little thesis, child of God, making your mess, your message is really called surviving your storms. I've already given you a context clue. Surviving your storms, surviving your storms, one of the ways of how, one of the many ways, particularly three ways that I want to emphasize on today in surviving your storms, these inevitable storms, is number one, we must understand that they are impromptu, impromptu storms. Number two, impervious storms. Number three, the intervention storms, storms that God intervened himself in. The impromptu, the impromptu. I know you, this is a smart class. You know what that word impromptu mean. Those that are online, I already know. I'm already preaching to the choir. Sometimes storms are just unannounced. They, they just, they're, not, they're not necessarily on display. If, if I was just worn, I think I would just be better prepared. One of the reasons why I don't like East Coast that much is because you can be in the East Coast and in the region of that all of a sudden, and then you can go to Florida. Those, those storms just come without an announcement. They're not on display. They, they're not on noticed. Much as what happened on yesterday. I mean, the Lord held back, back the, you know, the storms and the rain and the thunder and all of that during the feeding at the Woodlands campus of which we serve a lot of people. We were blessed by that. But let me tell you something. After 6 o'clock, y'all talk back to me. Them storms came without notice. Folk that were on their way to shopping places turned around. <laughs> Just got your half fixed. You don't want to get it wet up. And so, them storms. I like fishing. Bishop Rose and I, we love fishing. And there are some spots that I used to go to, and we used to go 40, 50 miles out. Because if, if you want to catch something big, you got to go in deep waters. Catch those big reds and big tunas and mahi mahi and wahi wahi. <laughs> Sharks and gars. And all of that and trouts and all of that. And you catch big fish. Certain fish you got to throw back. But we were able to catch the fish and Epstein and others. And we just had so much fun. And one time, one of those years when we went, I got the pictures, I got the receipts to show. I, I had a lineup. I still got it, amen? But what really discouraged me of not even considering it next time, because while we were out there, there was a storm that came from nowhere, from clear blue, pristine clouds. All of a sudden, Deacon Jones, the storms came from nowhere. How I many to know we turned that boat around and we just like tucked? Because sometimes storms are impromptu. And one of the reasons why I'm emphasizing that, that it does not come with sirens, Minister Hatter. Sometimes it's not easily detected. And that's important that you understand that storms are inevitable. Why? Because the devil is very close around to help and to try to explain the reasoning and the rationale why you are going through what you are going through that sometimes makes no sense. And sometimes he will convince you one of the reasons why you are going through these inevitable storms is because you're in a bad place with God. 
And you've got to know sometimes it's not because you're in a bad place with God, that God is upset with you. And when you are convinced of that child of God, you would not permit people to mistranslate the reason why you're going through what you're going through. It's just pop-ups, just a way of life. You don't have to be doing something bad to experience these inevitables. It's, it's just a way of life. Look at your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, it's just a way of life. I want you to be in concert with that truth that sometimes storms just show up. And when you understand and when you get, be in concert with the impromptus of storms, you would do several things. Number one, behind these impromptu of storms, you will pursue the lesson behind it. You will pursue the lesson. You will pursue the lesson, watch this, and the personal growth opportunities while in it. There is a lesson. Say it with me that part of my understanding the impromptus of storms is that I have to go after and find out the classroom of it. There is a reason why I'm experiencing unannounced storms. There's a reason why God didn't give me an inkling that I'm about to go into a financial situation. There is a lesson, and so you've got to dig deep beyond the surface, beyond uh, these vulnerabilities, uh, beyond these surface understanding. You've got to go deeper. There is a reason. If you are in God, you have to be sure of your relationship with God. And even if I'm experiencing an impromptu storm, this too will pass. There is a deeper revelation. And so part of our understanding the impromptus or these impromptu storms, we have to go after the institution behind it, the lesson behind it. There is a reason behind what we're going through. And then we must practice while going through these impromptus, these inevitable storms, we have to practice self-care. We have to practice self-care. We've, we've got to start caring about yourself. Don't become like unhinged and not caring about you because you're going through what you are asking God to bring you out of and yet he refuses to do it, not because to destroy you but to buff you and to make you better. But you still, you must be obligated to render self-compassion. You have to care about yourself. And one of the proofs that you care about yourself while experiencing these impromptu storms is when you engage in activities that will bring you comfort and peace. Yes, Lord, talk back to me. I'm not going to surrender my lesions in relationships that is toxic. Lord, help us. Just because you're going through uh, these inevitable storms, don't surrender, watch this, your standard. Don't surrender uh, your, your best self because you're going through a situation that's making you feel kind of sort of uncomfortable. Look at your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, you've got to practice self-care. I'm telling you, it ain't just based on decision. It's based on practice. And when you practice self-care, you would also practice um, uh, self-talk. Lord, have mercy, because part of my self-caring for me while going through these inevitable storms is when I talk about it. Look at your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, you've got to talk about it because you'll be, you'll be surprised the perspective and the solution that you will gander out of it if you just talk about it. Look at your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, talk about it. Go ahead and tell them you've got to, you've got to talk about it. Don't, don't keep it to yourself. Got to talk about it. If you got to get into your Clint closet and just talk to Jesus all by, listen, he is the great Messiah. He's the great uh, uh, priest. He can keep a secret. I wish I had somebody. And that he can comfort you. He says, Lord, I'll be with you always. Uh, the Spirit of God is a comforter. He'll comfort you. And sometimes you got to speak to a therapist. And let me emphasize that. A therapist. A person 
that can help you to understand these triggers and that can give you principles and coping skills and concepts and how to go through these inevitable storms. Sometimes God will work by way of revelation through others. You got to stay away from toxic people, watch this, and toxic situations. If I am to practice self-care, I got to be very preferential of people that I hang around. I mean, if they're in a storm and all of that and they're going crazy, you don't need to be hanging around them. You've got to run to safe shelter. People of faith. I ain't talking about no physical storm. I'm talking about financial storms. I'm talking about emotional problems. I'm talking about domestic problems. I'm talking about physical problems, mental situations, whatever you are going to, political situation, cultural situation, doctrinal situations. All of that can lead you to these inevitable storms. But the way to get through them is when you pursue the lesson and practice self-care. You need to pursue the lesson, practice self-care, but also persevere through them because you do that with, res with resilience and strength. So I'm going to just persevere. Proscoteresis. I'm going to persevere. The need to persevere is evident of resistance. So I'm going to persevere. Say for me, I'm going to persevere. Come on, you've got to stay determined in spite of the resistance. Those of people who are trying to fight you and impede your forwardness, you still have to persevere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So part of my really working through these impromptus and these inevitable storms, I have to, number one, as we said, we must pursue the lesson. Number two, we must practice self-talk that leads to self-care. And don't confuse self-care with selfless or selfishness. Selfishness, brother. Selfishness. Selfishness. Look at your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, we must practice self-care. And then we must persevere. Number two, number four, brother, we must stay attuned with prolonged storms. We must embrace the fact that sometimes we prolong our storms from a spirit of denial. Two years ago, we were supposed to exit out of the storm, but because we didn't know we were in it. Lord have mercy. We act like we were never in it. And, and so as a result, our storms were prolonged. And sometimes you got to have people around you that's not impressed with what you have. That run the risk to tell you the truth and say, you know what? You in a storm. Lean over to your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, don't be in denial because denial is a healthy response to an unhealthy situation. So I would not be in denial. Sometimes our storms are prolonged because we are in love affair with denial. And denial will nurture, watch this, suppression. You begin to internalize and suppress things. And unresolved suppression leads to and create, watch this, the spirit of isolation. And depression is teetering because if you are depressed, you want to extract yourself from social contact. You prefer closing the blinds instead of opening the blinds. And you begin to self-load and isolate yourself because of the spirit of denial. So you've got to watch this, pursue the lesson. You have to practice self-talk, self-care that creates self-talk. You remember that woman that was suffering for 12 years of a blood issue? She had a storm. But she began to say within herself, if I can just touch. Because self-thinking would talk you into self-talking. And there are certain things you can't share with anybody. I wish I had somebody. You've got to pursue the lesson. You've got to practice self-compassion. You have to persevere. And you have to embrace that sometimes our storms are prolonged because of this love affair that we have with denial. But then lastly, sometimes we must understand that storms are part-time. They are temporary. And they do have an expiration. 
Go with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 through 18. Watch this. For our light and monetary troubles, storms, are achieving for us, watch this, an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Next verse. So we must fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is passing away. But what is unseen is eternal. Look at your neighbor next door and say, this too will pass. I'm not in denial that I actually experience a storm, but the storm has rules and it's going to pass away. Said with me, and it came to pass. Lord have mercy. It, it came to pass. It's here. I experience it. That's a truth. But storms can only last so long. I'm telling you this so that you won't lose the rhythmic of your worship, that you won't lose uh, the energy of your praise and your uh, favorite hymnal, uh, that this storm will pass. Lean over to your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, it will pass away. It's, that's, it's just a matter of time. It will pass away. We move from the impromptu storm into the impervious storms. That's important. I had you to read the book of Matthew chapter 8. I want you to go back there to it. Verses 23 through 27, go back there to it. Um, it is a companion scripture that led, that, that, that helps to massage the book of Mark chapter 6. Different contexts but same water, same storm, same boat, same disciples, same Jesus. The difference in the book of Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 51, Jesus was praying at the mountainside while the disciples were in the middle of the lake in the storm on the fourth watch. In the book of Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27, Jesus was in the boat with them when that particular storm came. And it's been some theological arguments. Were these the same waters, the same storm? Not important. What we do understand is both of those scenarios, they experienced a storm. The difference was Jesus was in distance in the book of Mark chapter 6 praying while the disciples were in the middle of the water, straining. <laughs> and in the book of Matthew, chapter 8, verses 23 through 27, Jesus was in the boat with them, but he was asleep. Because the reason why I watch this, that God is not impervious of the storm, is that God is never moved by them. God have mercy. All right, let me help you. God is never affected by the storm. He's only affected by the storm that affects you. So he moves himself to help you to weather the storm that is affecting you that now affects him. But storms does not affect God. Lord have mercy. Um, it's not that God is impervious of storms. He's just impervious of, of the storm. The storm does not influence him, but your storm does. Lord have mercy. You, you, you. Storms that move God in as much as sickness does not move God. But the one who is sick, who's standing by the word, moves him to healing. So by his stripes, we're healed. I wish I had a classroom. We feel just because you're going through some poverty, automatically license God to move. No, the poverty that affects you 
to where you're about to throw it in the towel and give up and believe in God, that's when he comes in as Superman because he's affected by your storm that is affecting you. I wish I had somebody here. So whatever you are going through, he's well aware. He's well aware. He's well aware of what you are going through, the impervious storm. He's not affected by the storm, but he's affected by the storm that affects you. He's well aware. That's important because the devil sometimes can convince you that God has distanced himself because you've You've done all the right things. You've been praying. You've been believing. You've been standing on scriptures and look like your situation has gotten worse. Hallelujah. But he's aware. And sometimes his awareness is his qualifying you to handle it by leaving you in it. Lord have mercy. Just because the Lord is not impervious. <laughs> that storms cannot penetrate him. Our plights does not penetrate him. But what penetrates him is his word while you're going through what you feel is going to overwhelm you that moves him uh, to speak and to do on your behalf. These inevitables, these impromptus, these unannounced storms will come. And not because you are in the bad behavior of God. Not because you're in a bad place. It's because life be life in. <laughs> it, it just has nothing to do with your level of disobedience, my dear sister. It just happens. Because the Bible says it's just a matter of birth. Man that is born of a woman is but a few days and full yes, of baby mama drama. <laughs> you're, you're, I mean, you're full of all kinds of situations, these impromptus that you weren't prepared to handle. You have enough savings because you were saving under the premise of last week issue and you were not prepared that the whole roof came off. You saved enough for the shingles. You saved enough for a patch job. You didn't know that you had to rebuild the house. I wish I had a talk back to me. These are impromptus. These are things that perhaps you didn't prepare for and yet it comes and it was like, God, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to destroy me? No. What he's trying to do is buff you. He's trying to perfect you. He's trying to make sure that he turned what we call as our mess into a message, as a test into a testimony. But then lastly, because my amens have is about. We move from impromptus to impervious, impervious storms into an intervention. The fact that Jesus made his disciples get into the boat to go on the other side to Bethsaida suggests that they were not willing to go without resistance. And if we were to be honest, there are some mandates that the Lord requires us to follow that is not all the time seemingly to be a Kate walk. I wish I had somebody. I know that you've been in the faith long and you have seniority with kingdom living. But there are some situations where which the Lord would mandate you to do that may not necessarily feel like a cakewalk. The fact that Jesus made his disciples, made, made his disciples to get in the boat, go over to Bethsaida on the other side was suggestive that they were not willing to go. I believe that I have some co-signers with that. Because if they were willing, then Jesus wouldn't have had to make them go. Some kind of way he used uh, 
incentives. He used certain situations, but ultimately the Bible was quite clear. He used a finished destination laced with a promise. He said, I need for you to go on the other side of which I will meet you there. Lord have mercy. Now, this was not, watch this. This was not a moment of defiance or disobedience, but a moment of discomfort of being separated from the one they love. For the first time, they've never witnessed Jesus not being with them. All through Jesus' ministry, the disciples were with them, and even when Jesus was not there, and they tried to duplicate, in fact, simile what Jesus did. The demons got on them. And so that was a discomfort. So can I cut Peter, James, John, and the other disciples some slack? I understand, Jesus. You will no longer be with us in this boat. In our travel, you've always rode in the SUV with us. You've always... Uh, uh, you've always got on the cruise ship with us. But because you told us that you're going to meet us on the other side, I guess we'll get on the cruise ship. That's okay. I understand. All right, Jesus, because the comfort of it is that in spite of my discomfort of not wanting to separate myself from the physical presence of Jesus, I find comfort in knowing that if nobody is praying, Jesus is. He says, I need you to go on the other side while I stay over here to pray. Lord have mercy. I'm going somewhere. So if I help them to go on the other side from a, with a place of comfort, Jesus the Messiah, watch this, intentionally makes no agreement with his, with his disciples that he's going to meet them on the other side drama free. Lord have mercy. That's not what he said. He said, I need you to go from point A to point B where I'm going to meet you at point B. But what he leaves out, the middle between A and B, God is a kind of God that will give you your destination, which is your point B. But he leaves out uh, the frustration. I wish I had. High five your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, he gives me the green light to marry him. But he leaves out. He's dealing with some hidden issues. Lord have mercy. He, he gives me the green light to get your job. But what he leaves out, that there are some co-workers that don't even know my name that has signed a contract with the devil to make sure that I don't enjoy this promotion, this increase. He does not disclose the entire component of what they will encounter before they reach their destination. If God were to give you the full picture that between A and B, that's going to be a storm, your intellectual rationale and fear and faithlessness will talk you out of leaving from point A to point B. If he were to tell you that, yes, I'm going to meet you at point B, I don't have a problem with that. But if you were to also include it, there is a middle issue that's going to try to drown you, that's going to try to upset you and turn over the boat. I wish I'd turn over the very instrument that's trying to get you to your promise. I don't think that you will be as inclined. Can I preach it like you feel it now? I'm and so he gives the def destination and leaves out the frustration that goes along with it. The frustration was the storm that they were experiencing. I know that you have a utopia. I know that everything is going well in your life. I know that you've never been disappointed. I know that not only are you paying your bills up, but you're paying them out. I know that it's been just a, a love boat for you. I mean, you've, you've had peace all year. I mean, you've, you've had so much drama-free life 
until you feel and we feel sometimes that we're doing God a favor if we give him some praise because everything, I really don't have to do, I don't have to be here. I'm really doing you a favor to come to worship, Bishop. You ought to be glad that I'm here. The problem, the reason why you feel like that, because everything has been going in perpendicular to your desired place. And so uh, you think that you're doing God a favor to lift your hands and to praise him because you ain't been through no new drama. High five your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, but keep on living you see you just in part a you still are sure you've not taken off yet high five your neighbor next door and say neighbor as soon as that boat detached as soon as you break away from shore high five your neighbor next door and say neighbor don't throw away your hat too soon don't don't throw away your praise too soon the bible says so don't allow the severity of your storm to cause you to forget what jesus said he says i'm gonna meet you on the other side what comes out of the mouth of god is god prophetic promise and covenant high five your neighbor one more time and say neighbor god don't say nothing just to be saying something he makes a promise which means that your storm is not permitted to destroy you but represent a context clue that I'm getting closer to my promise high five your neighbor next door and say neighbor if I'm going through what I'm going through let it be a clue that I'm getting closer to my storm to my promise so in other words so my storm becomes a bridge to the other side I cannot get to point B unless I go through the middle I wish I had somebody I've got to go through the middle I can't get to point B unless I go through the middle I prefer to stay at point A but point A won't get me to point B I've, I've got to leave from my comfort level high five your neighbor next door and say neighbor let your storm be your bridge to get you to point B. So in verse 48, if I can remove the microcosm to the microcosm, and let me emphasize this, verse 48, the Bible says, and Jesus saw their struggle, not on the first shift, not on the second shift, not on the third shift, because the first shift, uh, you can still handle it. On the second shift, you can get a part-time job. On the third shift, you can go stay with mama and them. I wish I, but on the fourth shift, that's when God will show up. It's when you feel the next wave is designed to take me out. That's when God is going to show up. So they thought Jesus was a ghost because he began to walk on water. High five your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, you've got to see who Jesus is through the binoculars of your storm. Don't allow your storm, watch this, to distort the revelation who Jesus is. So much so, don't allow your mess to mistranslate your message. High five your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, let that black man preach. Whatever you focus on, you will expand and exaggerate and ultimately attract. I wish I had. High five your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, because Peter focused on the ghost and not on Jesus. It exaggerated who Jesus was. And everything that you focus on, you will exaggerate and uh, attract. Who want to find company with a ghost? Who want to find company with folk that scares you? I wish I had somebody here. Some of y'all want your loved ones to talk back to you. I wish I had somebody, those that have deceased, quite to the contrary. I love my dad, but if I were to go and visit him in the graveyard, I don't want him to come out the grave. I'm going to take off. I wish I high five your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, that's scary. I wish I, because that's what storms does. It will allow you to uh, extract yourself from the help that's there. I wish I had somebody here. They thought Jesus was a ghost. But Peter says, let me not mess up. 
I can't see him clearly, but I'm in relationship. Peter says, if you can just speak to me. I, I wish I had somebody. I, I just need to hear your voice. I don't need a lot of scriptures. I just need for you to give me a word. I wish I had somebody here. I can't see you clear because the storm has distorted my discernment. But if I can hear through the audible, I wish I had somebody. If you can breathe uh, to my liturgical lungs, I can know that it's your voice and not last night's cabbage. I wish I had somebody high five your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, I just need to have a little talk with Jesus because I know his voice. Say something now. I need you to bid me to come forth. And so that means I may have to shut off email. I may have to shut off Facebook. Are you praying or in me? I may have to not read this week's text because I need Jesus to speak to me. Just a little talk with Jesus will make it all right. Are you praying or in me? Just one some scripture can feed my faith. Just one some word can cause me to have courage. Are you praying or in me? And so can I close with this? It doesn't matter what storm you are experiencing. God will come toward you. And not only Jesus will come toward you, but he'll climb in the boat. He'll get in the mess with you. Are you praying or in me? And once Jesus come in your house, the storm has to die down. Once Jesus entered your world, the situation has to calm down. Are you praying with me? I dare you to invite Jesus. I dare you to welcome his word. Once Jesus enters, every hell has to bow down to the power of his name. Because at his name, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess. And then can you hear the story that while they were dealing with the storm, the Bible says that the Jesus was at the bottom of the deck, asleep fully. Are you praying with me? Because what bothers you don't bother him. Are you praying with me? And then sometimes when we've been hanging around victim vomit, we want everybody to feel what we feel. Are you praying or in me? But at least they had enough theological sense to go to the one that can help them. Are you praying or in me? And sometimes you've got to shake Jesus. How do I shake him? Is when I use his word on him. Sometimes you got to shake him that by his stripes we'll heal. Sometimes you've got to shake him. When the enemy comes to eat my flesh, he will die every time. Sometimes you've got to shake him that man can live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Sometimes you've got to shake God that no weapon that's formed against you will be able to prosper. Sometimes you've got to shake God. I, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continually be. And let me tell you something. God is a kind of God will not allow you to shake him and awaken him and not speak to your storm. The Bible says when you use the word, he'll tell your storm, peace be still. High five your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, peace be still. Come on, Woodlands made more noise than this. Shake your neighbor next door and say, neighbor, when I wake Jesus up, by using the word back on him 
he'll speak to my storm and say peace be still but listen here you don't mess with a God that know how to speak to the waves and to the waters and to the winds are you praying with me if I can be ghetto now that's a bad high five your neighbor next door and say neighbor God our service bad capital B bad are you praying with me you don't mess with a person that can make wind cease you don't mess with a person that can speak to your storm and it has to die down and the Bible says after everybody witnessed that they said surely must be the son of God are you praying with me and so the Lord allows you to go through your storm so folk that don't know him the way you do can get to know him of how God dealt with your storm are you praying with me do I have any co-signers do I have anybody who understand that if I stay in the boat hallelujah the waves are not permitted to, to turn my boat over as long as I keep Jesus in the boat everything is going to be alright do I have any co-signers who understand if the storm come let the wind blow let the waters come as long as I have Jesus in the boat with me everything is going to be alright I'm talking to every person who understand keep Jesus with you in spite of what you go through keep him in the boat keep him in your prayer life keep him in your work life keep him in your family keep him in your mind keep him in your spirit now watch this when the disciples received the spirit of God on the day of Pentecost they were able to do the greater works because they had the paracletos alongside dictating through them which is the spirit of God alongside empowering you to do what your flesh cannot do after the spirit of God came tongue speaking getting folks saved 3,000 got saved from Peter's message the Bible says they were able to do the greater works which means they were able to do sister Bell the same work that Jesus did when he was walking the face of the earth when we received Jesus Christ as, as Lord and Savior it was a spiritual impartation the spirit of God is in you not for some type of pedagogical perfunctories but the spirit of God is in you not for a shout <laughs> not to modify your dress cold the spirit of God is in you to keep you so that you can live a victorious life can I help somebody so you can do the greater works the same work Jesus did you've got to understand and I heard a, a scholar say Jesus was lazy not from the sense of lazy Jesus just didn't move he just spoke Lord have mercy the greater works is your ability to use your tongue to speak to your storms and command those storms to be at peace not to go victim. 
I need you right now, whatever storms that you are in, not physical storms in terms of rain, water, and the climate. I'm talking about these financial storms. I'm talking about felling storms. I'm talking about low self-esteem, depression, domestic issues, and cultural issues, generational curses, those kinds of things, those demonic attacks, those are storms. And sometimes there are, they are impromptu. Yes. Understand, God is not impervious. Not to the storm, but he is influenced by the storm that has affected you. Storms does not permeate him. <laughs> but you do. Did y'all get the difference? Because if, if that were the case, everybody in the medical center that's sick will be healed without asking. Sickness does not move God. But his word moves him through your sickness. By his stripes, we were healed. There's no past tense in him. We are healed, present help right now. Future may be. If we were, if we are, then we'll heal even while sick. But you've got to use the word to move him on your behalf. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? People in this city in places of power don't fully understand. They will go crazy trying to understand what I don't understand about myself. But what I can conclude, I'm a man of prayer and faith. And then what I can conclude, anybody that fights me is already defeated. Don't let me get on my knees. Don't let me throw my cap. Come on now. Don't let me get my chair and get some help. Somebody need to call your riders now. You need to, come on, where are your boys? The word of God, get some help. How do I get some help? In praise. How do I get some help? In prayer. How do I get some help? In petitioning him. You get help. Every one of you at least have one legion of angels. And not even a smidget of angels. We've charged on our behalf because we won't use the word. I go in meetings and I don't know what necessarily to say. I say, Lord, I know, I know the meeting has already been arranged and they plan the game. But I need you to release, dispatch a few angels on my behalf so I can come out with at least something. Because they've already said we're going to meet with him because we don't want him to, to you know, put us out there. We ain't going to give him nothing. But when you use God's word over your situation, he dispatch angels ministering angels on your behalf. You listen to what I'm saying? We have five minutes. I need you to lift your hands right now. Lift your hands, everybody. Can I tell you this? Don't you allow people, predicaments, and situations to disappoint you to the degree to where you lose faith. Because what you've indirectly done, you've built shrines around people as if they can't fail. Can I tell you? People fail. People disappoint. People run late. Hallelujah. People get defeated. People lie. 
That's just, it is what it is. But you are not going to build shrines around folk. But you're going to build your allegiance around the altar of God's love. Because at the end of the day, you have a strong prayer life. He didn't bring you this far to leave you. He's going to be with you. And if he brought you out of this, he's got to do it again. Have you ever been at this threshold? If you did it for me then, you have to do it for me now. Okay, you know what that means? You see, some of us, all of us have heard when David says, I look to the hills from which come in my help. That was a previous deliverance. He says, I got to look back on what he did for me yesterday to draw my yesterday's victories into my today's battle. So I'm going to look to the hills where my help came from then. Lord, see, y'all... See, we thought that it was Michelangelo's painting that David looked at some tapestry. This was not some beautiful painting. This was while he was in the hills of Adullam. <laughs> Hiding from an angry king called Saul after they killed him and mutilated him. He says, but he brought me out and made me a king. Hallelujah. He didn't name him a king at the cave. He named him a king while he was in the field. How many know that God knows how to name you before you become it? Lord, help. He know how to call you what you are not until you become. So he named him a king while in the field as a shepherd's boy. But crowned him king. Lord, have mercy while in the cave of Adullam. So he reminisced as I leave. I got to look to the hills from whence come at my help. And then he says, I found out that when I do it like that, he's a present help in time of need. Some of y'all got to stop thinking on your right now and start thinking on what he did for you yesterday and pull your yesterday's victory into today's battle. I didn't, I didn't say the live in your past because you cannot unscramble scramble eggs. But I certainly want you to use your, your past as a platform, as a hammock, as a springboard to launch you to the next level. We're about to leave now. Lift those hands because, yes, the weapon has been formed, but I see that welcome deteriorating in the spirit. This week has been a very, this week has been a very, very mentally and taxful week. This 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 week has been a very, very tactful physically, financially, and mentally, and all of that. And you know how it is as your hands are down, your eyes are closed, hinge to my voice. I've earned the right to, if I decide to stay home, rest. That's my business. I've earned the right. I've been, I've been pastoring a long time. And I pastor pastors. I've been doing that a long time. I'm not a novice. But the Lord says, I'm going to strengthen you to be here because what's in your belly need to come out in their spirit. Because what they don't know, there's a storm that's lurking, that's an ambush. But because of this word that you've released, they now have the victory that everything is going to be all right. So is well. And while they sing to you, 
I want you to join with them. Those that are you that are online, I want you to join with them. Live streamers. Come on. One thing about this ministry, we're going to give you word, we're going to give you teaching, we're going to give you good worship and fellowship, people of like faith. But I don't believe in begging. I've never begged. It's not that I'm too proud to not do that. But it's not scriptural. The Bible says you ask. Don't beg. I'm, I'm going to ask that you be loyal to your blessed place. I want you to be loyal to the principle of giving. Be loyal to the laws of sowing and reaping. Not because you need a prophetic word. That's weak. And there's nothing wrong with prophecy. I'm a prophet. I prophesy. And it come to pass. But I want you to stretch your faith. You who hear. I put no obligation on anyone, no pressure rather. But I do welcome you to be a part of this giving moment. Now watch this. This is not a moment where which the church is trying to extract something from you. Come on, that's ignorant teaching. But this is a moment where which you are placing a demand on God to financially give you a harvest of overflow. Those of you, if you need an envelope, those of you who are online, I want you to give online. Do your level best. Do your undivided best where the Lord is going to give you a financial return if you be loyal to his promises. Stop saying, I don't have it. You don't say that at that retail store. You don't say that if you want to get that concert ticket. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying life. I found out that people do what they want to do. So stop saying when it comes down to church giving, I don't have it. Because some kind of way, what you feel like you don't have, you make a way to get it for other things. So I want you to be a blessing. Let me tell you something. I'm like John. I come to bear witness of the promises of the Lord. Let me tell you, when you give it, it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And he'll cause men to use their power, ability, and influence to bless your life. He'll cause situations to line up to your desired place. Stuff that'll work out for you. I want you to be a blessing electronically by way of bank card, credit card. Physically, you still write checks. I still write them. Maybe you want to give cash, whatever the case may be. Your money is safe. It's safe for two reasons. I have a law enforcement officer here. Two of them. And they carry. Please understand. They have my authorization to use whatever, about any means. Because I got people online listening. Oh. And then the second safety is that's a safe site when you go on there is safe and so we want you to be okay with that all right lose that fear lose that inhibition and that reservations and i want you to be a blessing to the body of christ now what make your seed what makes this church uh vulnerable for blessings what makes this church good ground is that we're doing kingdom make work we're feeding the hungry we're clothing the naked we're visiting we are and not just annually, we do it every day, every week. We're helping people. I just don't highlight it because that's what I've been born and anointed to do. And when, you, and when you've been born to do something, that's all you know to do, so it's not a big deal. So I've been guilty of not highlighting all the stuff. And the, amen. If Jackie were to give a little listing of all the people that we help, it will so encourage you and surprise you too as well. Amen. So we want you to be a blessing to this ministry. 
that is known all over, all over, all over. Be a blessing to the body of Christ. Be a blessing to the body of Christ. We were so blessed. I'm so proud of our Woodlands campus. Amen. Amen. Proud of that campus. Acres of land. God bless them. And people were everywhere. Cars were everywhere. And we were able, sister. She wonder is our administrator doing an excellent job. She don't like me to brag on her. I understand. And all of those helpers and those administrators there, they're doing such an awesome job. You know, just young professionals. And I just so appreciate it. It makes my job. I'm, and I'm asked the question all the time, how are you able to do what you do to run a college and to, to have pastors and to have churches, multiple locations, and, and uh, to be a community leader, a national leader? How are you able to do it? Well, number one, I have the anointing of God. Number two, I have good friends. I have good people that understand directives. Amen. They understand the need to, to embrace vision casting and all of that. And so I have people who's, who've, who've been with me a long time, who've been with me a long time, a long time, and they know what to do, know what to do. So um, let's be a blessing financially. Those of you online, we're about eight minutes over. And we want you to be a blessing financially to this ministry. Somebody give me an envelope too as well. Give me an envelope and a writing pen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, one thing too, before you... I talk a lot, don't I? Don't say it. Don't say nothing. Um, the Lord has blessed us always. Uh, we just find favor because if I were to rename this feast from super feast, I would call it the people's feast because it's just made up of everybody from every political stratum, every religious stratum, whatever the case may be. And uh, we're able to do all the stuff that we do because of generosity, the, 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 the care and the love and the commitment of people like you and people that are around the world. Channel 39 and Channel 13 and etc. they they help us to get the word out in terms of this this food drive and um, they're having it on December the 18th live all day where people can drive up to the station and drop off stuff man that's a privilege that's a blessing amen uh, there are hundreds of organizations would love to have that kind of um, relationship they approached us and we're so honored we said yes readily <laughs> yes and December the 18th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Live in the studios, Channel 39 Studios, and of course George Brown, as well as our Starbucks at City Cathedral at Woodlands. They'll be open to where people can drive up. And then the Sprouts Farmer's Market also rented some of their locations. They even said, if y'all, you can take them all if you want. I said, no, we just need the Woodland one and the Paraline, the uh, Paraland one. And, uh, and those who volunteered at those locations, raise your hand. You volunteered. And we got other volunteers on our list. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know that I can count on you again. And then, of course, the Kroger's location, too, as well. North, Northwest 290 Spring Sugarland area. And then Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. We good. Chick-fil-A, the central location, northwest location, the south location, Sugarland and Woodlands. So we've already supplied you with a flyer, a handbill that we want you to look at. I take the time. I wanted to do this. We have volunteers and I have administrators that can do it. This is Stephanie, uh, our regional director. God bless her. Amen. 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 Yes. And all of them, Jackie and Renee and others are answering the phone. Everybody that's, that's working. I get in trouble when I start calling names. But we, on the back of this form, and those that are online too, it should be on there. Put it out there for me. I, I want, you know, let's pause for the calls. Anything about people, the underprivileged, uh, the unemployed, and those that are employed, because just because those individuals that are in line, they may have jobs. They're just going through some hard times. I have to talk to some Republican friends of mine, and I have Democratic friends, independent friends, Republican. They're all human beings. And I have to tell one of them, I say, you, you do know people don't deserve to be poor. <laughs> you do know people go through hard times. You do know that people need assistance sometimes. And so 
I want you to help us. I want you to help us to get this done. On the back of here is the name, email address that you'll put, and the cell phone, and then you can check off what location is near you that you can help. Also, we have some optional times, and they're not written in blood. If you can't work from 7 to 10.30 a.m., from 7 a.m. to 10.30, or from 1.30 to from 10.30 to 1.30, just check off the time that you can't work. I'd rather have somebody than to have nobody. So I want you to help us because the worst thing that can happen at all of these locations that have been made available, then we have nobody to, to, to work these sites. So I want you to help us. And I wanted to pause for the calls and explain the importance behind this. I want to thank all of our people who work in the kitchen, Minister Hatter, Sister Janelle, and others that are working, Travis, and uh, the, the co-captains, and everybody that's working. We appreciate it. Even... I see Jalen here too as well. She get the students. She's an educator, and she bring all those kids there. Yeah. And she helped the volunteer. And that's, we're so we're so excited about that. So please, I'm going to ask that you receive one of these handbills, one of these flyers that gives you the detailed locations that we need your help in. And of course, we'll have some training too as well by way of Zoom or conference call that we will further discuss the plan of action and the strategy and what we need to do in terms of your being proficient as a site volunteer of these locations. All right, you've heard what's been mentioned. I want you to stand and let's be a blessing financially to the body of Christ. If I've been a blessing to you and you want to sow in my life, we certainly want to do that My family. I want you to do that first family. God bless you. And please don't leave because the praise team is going to come. The praise dancers. They are going to get ready to give us a wonderful, wonderful rendition of a beautiful worship. Let us all come. Let's follow these ushers. Let's follow these ushers. Let's follow these servant brothers. God bless you. praise dance worship that's what spiritual dancing is it's like the worship you remember that when David danced out of his clothes or at least his outer garments and it was likened to worship but I want sister Juanita our director of the agape ministry that happens to be the pastoral ministry and the personal needs I want her to come and she have something to say come on let's just give her an amen hand clap sister Juanita Good morning, City Cathedral. Good morning. The Agape Ministry is sponsoring the First Family Christmas. Yes, the first.